Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Oh my, it's been a busy one. Starbase continued to be the launch site that never sleeps, with rollings out and in of various vehicles, and the arrival of around 350 concrete trucks to pour in the concrete for launch pad B. Falcon 9 made a whopping five orbital launches over the week, including NASA's Crew-10 mission, and China wasn't far behind with three launches of their own. Rocket Lab were also busy with an electron launch from New Zealand, and really much, much more. This was a super busy week, so sit back and enjoy. The week began with Monday's rollout of Ship 35, next expected vehicle to launch on Flight 9, and it's got big boots to fill. It's the third second generation Starship, and its two predecessors, Ship 33 and Ship 34, both failed quite spectacularly during Flight 7 and 8, with loss of ship before reaching Apogee. A lot of people have concerns that the new plumbing layout of Starship Block 2 is vulnerable to leaks and ruptures, which results in flammable propellants leaking out where they shouldn't, causing fires and engine overheating due to loss of generative cooling, which is possibly what happened to the vacuum wrapped engine missing from Ship 34 in this leaked screenshot. After arriving at the Massey's test site, Ship 35 completed two rounds of cryogenic proof tests on the 11th and 12th of March. The next tests in line will be static fires, but it will probably be a few weeks before we see this, it doesn't have engines yet after all, and after that, integrated flight test, which is expected to be a copy of the flight plan for flight 7 and 8, but hopefully the vehicle makes it to Apogee and Starship can finally deploy a payload. This will be simulator dummy Starlings, which were spotted being delivered on NASA Space Flight's Starbase livestream. Alongside Ship 35 at Massey's was Booster 16, the Super Heavy first stage expected to be paired with it for Flight 9. It's currently lacking its grid fins and hot stage ring, though the latter is usually not installed until the final few days preceding launch. Thursday saw the return of Ship 35 from Massey's to the Starship Mega Bay, where it will continue to undergo the final phases of its construction, which will include the installation of its aft flaps, and it'll also have its engines installed, and SpaceX will also have to implement any changes based on the data from Flight 7 and 8, so that hopefully this vehicle lasts a little bit longer than its predecessors. And if you want a reminder of how massive these rockets are, look how tiny those huge semi-trucks are driving past it. They're absolutely dwarfed by it. Even though SpaceX seemed to have nailed the recoverability aspect of Starship's first stage with three successful catches to their name, it looks like Stage Zero still requires extensive refurbishment following each launch. While certainly nothing like the carnage that resulted from Flight 1, there are still a lot of workers scaffolding and cherry pickers around the launch mount doing something. This seems to be a lot of workers and lot of equipment for mere inspections. Will the pad be able to support the rapid launch cadence that SpaceX want from Starship, or will that need to be left to the upgraded design of Pad B? Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments below. Speaking of launch pad B, it's progressing well. The launch mount is still swarmed in scaffolding, but is nonetheless looking more and more complete as the weeks tick by, with last week seeing the delivery of more pipework for the structure. Over at the site itself, you can see that SpaceX have recently installed this big A-frame gantry structure next to the eventual location of that aforementioned launch mount. I wonder how this will look when completed and integrated with the launch mount. A large pipe was also spotted being trucked to the site, which could be to supply the pad's water deluge system. Starship Gazer captured this shot at 9pm on Saturday. This is the arrival of the first of around 350 concrete trucks, heading to launch pad B to begin the enormous flame trench concrete pour. Starbase really never sleeps. A very early days Ship 37 was spotted in the open towards the end of the week. Here's its nose cone and payload section moving across the production yard, yet to receive its control flaps and a fair amount of its heat shield tiles as well. It was transported from Star Factory into Mega Bay 2, where it'll be stacked to full height. Ever wondered what it's like to drive up to an orbital class crew rated rocket? Check out this footage from NASA's livestream coverage of the biggest launch of last week, the launch of Crew-10 to the International Space Station. The crew consists of NASA astronauts Anne McLean and Nicole Ayes, as well as JAXA astronaut Takuya Onishi and Roscosmos cosmonaut Kirill Pieskov. The first launch attempt for Crew-10 was on the 12th of March, but sadly this was scrubbed due to a suspected pocket of air trapped in the hydraulics on one of the clamps on the strongback, the structure that holds and stabilizes the Falcon 9 while it stands vertically on the pad. 
Another attempt was made two days later, and this time things were more successful, with countdown reaching zero and liftoff of the Falcon 9 from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy. Not long after stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage made a successful landing at Landing Zone 1, gotta love those third-person views of the landings, and the Dragon capsule, called the Endurance, separated from the rocket's second stage. Here's a great clip of the spacecraft arriving at the station, docking with the space station's Harmony module. I'm sure the crew were relieved to arrive. Audio communications between SpaceX's crew operations and resource engineer and the Crew-10 crew indicated that a burst disk ruptured in Endurance's toilet waste system, and the crew were asked not to use it, and instead use their contingency supplies, which I'm not sure if I want to know the full details of. <laughs> At least they can now live like royalty with the bad boy that is the International Space Station's toilet facilities. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'd be the best fit for an astronaut personally. <laughs> Crew 10 wasn't the only Falcon 9 outing last week. In total, there were four other launches. Two of these were Starlink missions, one of them seen here launching in the background of the yet-to-launch Crew 10 rocket. Together, the two missions launched a combined 42 more Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, of which 26 had direct to cell capabilities. The first of the other two Falcon 9 launches was on the 12th of March. This was carrying NASA's SphereX Observatory and four punch satellites to low Earth orbit from the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. The SphereX is a near infrared space telescope designed to conduct an all sky survey measuring the near infrared spectra of around 450 million galaxies to map the entire sky, and will ultimately help us to understand more about the early universe and the rapid expansion that occurred moments after the Big Bang, as well as further our understanding into how materials formed and how dark matter is potentially distributed. Meanwhile, the punch satellites will work together to study the sun's corona and how it transitions into the solar wind, helping scientists understand how the sun's atmosphere becomes the stream of particles that impacts Earth and the rest of the solar system. The mission will also strengthen our understanding of space weather events like coronal mass ejections, which will be extremely valuable as these events can disrupt satellites, power grids and communications on Earth, as well as affect astronauts and rovers and robots exploring throughout the solar system. All four punch satellites were deployed successfully, along with the SphereX telescope, and the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed at landing zone 4. Falcon 9 made another outing on Friday when SpaceX launched their Transporter 13 mission to orbit from Vandenberg. This was not just the 13th transport mission, but also the 13th flight of this particular first stage booster. SpaceX's transporter missions don't have a primary payload per se, instead they carry a huge number of much smaller rideshare satellites. Transporter 13 featured a total of 74 payloads during its flight, which consisted of CubeSats, Microsats, hosted payloads, a re-entry capsule, and an orbital transfer vehicle which in turn carried 11 payloads to be deployed at a later time. It was a beautiful day for launch at New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula on Saturday. Rocket Lab conducted the first of eight dedicated launches to build out Japanese Fern IQPS's planned radar imaging constellation, which will consist of 36 synthetic aperture radar satellites. Payload deployment was confirmed around 55 minutes after launch, wrapping up another successful electron mission for Rocket Lab. China conducted three launches across the week. The first was on the 11th of March. This was the first launch ever from the Wenchang Commercial Space Launch Site's Launch Complex 1. The vehicle was a Long March 8Y6, carrying the fifth batch of 18 space sail satellites to low Earth orbit, which will serve a similar role to SpaceX's Starlink, providing global users with low latency, high speed satellite broadband internet. The next launch on the 15th of March, this time it was the Long March 2D, carrying the Superview NEO 302 to low Earth orbit. This is an Earth imaging satellite that official sources have stated will be used for peaceful purposes such as land resource surveys, urban management and disaster prevention, though it's widely understood that these particular satellites also play a significant reconnaissance role for China's military. The most recent launch from China was earlier today. A Ceres-1 rocket, operated by Galactic Energy, launched a meteorology satellite to low Earth orbit, along with two AirSat Earth imaging satellites. Not much more info has been shared about these payloads, so yeah. Russia conducted a rare non-Soyuz launch on Sunday. An Angara 1.2 rocket launched from the Plesetska launch site in Russia, carrying three Cosmos military communication satellites to low Earth orbit. Military payloads are, in general, always very secretive, even more so for Russia, so not a lot more to discuss regarding this one. 
Lion Aerospace was not back in action on Saturday. Massive apologies for this. It really wasn't my intention to miss a Saturday for Kerbal Space Program videos, but I had the flu and had no energy to make a video, and I couldn't speak to record a commentary. I'm on the mend now, so hopefully we should be back in action this Saturday. Make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss it, and hey, if you want to support me further like the amazing people on the right did, then consider joining my Patreon or YouTube channel member program using the links below. And if you like this video, I'm told there's a button you can click specifically to indicate that. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching today's episode, and I'll catch you next time.